Hello everybody. This is a talk entitled The Life and Death of Stars and is part of a series of introductory astronomy talks that I've put together and that I've given on various uh, cruise ships and excursions all around the world. So if we're going to talk about stars, we perhaps should talk first about our sun. Here's a fantastic sunset showing the sun going down, shows just how small the sun actually is against the horizon there. But of course, we'd perhaps look at a few basic facts about our sun before we go any further. So what is it? Well, people talk about it being as a giant ball of gas. The temperature of five and a half thousand degrees centigrade. But that's of course the temperature at the visible surface that you can see in this marvellous photograph here. It's really rather large, 1.2 million kilometres in diameter, so that's over a hundred times the size of the Earth. And in terms of volume, you could drop a million Earths inside it. If you want the numbers, the mass is 2 times 10 to the power 30 kilograms, and it's uh, just a, a number you can't get your brain around. But that's 333,000 times the mass of the Earth. And that tells us something about the density. With it being a million times the volume, but only 300,000 times the mass, the density is quite low, around about 1.4 grams for every cubic centimetre on average, and that's only a little bit more than the density of water, which is of course one gram. That's because it's made mostly of these very light gases. Hydrogen makes up nearly 75%, helium nearly 25%, leaving a tiny fraction of the other elements, all of the interesting ones, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and so on, make up a really very small fraction indeed but an interestingly significant one, of course, from our point of view, as they are the essentials of life. It's around 4.6 billion years old, and that's a little bit older than the Earth. The Sun probably formed in the centre of the solar system while the Earth was still getting its act together in the cloud of gas and dust that was left over orbiting around the Sun. But we talk about the uh, sun being a ball of gas and that's not really quite right it's actually a ball of plasma and plasma is a fourth state of matter the normal states of matter that we're familiar with are solids where all the atoms are rigidly packed together and held together by strong bonds liquids where the bonds between the atoms are weaker and they're able to flow around each other are still held together but nevertheless the shape can change very easily and gases, where the atoms and molecules are free to move around and expand into any container they find themselves in. And plasma is like a gas in that respect, but when you get to such high temperatures, all of the electrons get ripped away from the nuclei of the atoms. So the atoms are torn apart and releasing their electrons. So you get, in the case of uh, hydrogen plasma, you'll have a sea of protons mixed with a sea of electrons all flowing through each other and it'll be an electrically charged uh, material as a result. But if we begin this story with uh, Lord Kelvin who asked some very interesting and deep questions about the Sun, he started off with what powers the Sun? He couldn't really understand how it was managing to continually put out the same amount of heat without apparently cooling down. Any normal object that's hot, losing heat out to space, is going to cool down. Unless, of course, new energy is being supplied to keep it at the same high temperature. And Kelvin wondered what the source of that energy could be, and how long could the sun continue to shine based on that source of energy. And being a good Victorian era gentleman, he decided to do some comparisons and he worked out that comparing it to the system of the age, the power generated by steam trains from the burning of coal, if he had a pile of coal the same mass as the sun, then he figured that he could extract energy from that by burning the coal 
at the same rate that the sun was pouring energy out into space and it would only last for 3,000 years. Now the problem with that is he knew already that the earth had been around longer than that and that civilizations in ancient Egypt and China, for example, had got records dating back to more than 3,000 years ago. And so that couldn't be right. So he turned to the other force that they then knew about, which was gravity. And he realized that contraction and things falling down a hill release energy under gravity. You have an object and you let it fall, the work done on it by the force of gravity as it falls makes it pick up speed and then as it hits the ground it will dump all that energy as heat. Likewise if you try and lift an object off the ground you have to do work against gravity and put energy into it to lift it higher up. So he realized that actually a contraction of the, the sun by just 1% would release enough energy from gravity to power the sun for 200,000 years, which is a really quite a long time, much longer than you could get from burning that mass of coal. The trouble was that geologists by this stage were beginning to realize that the earth was probably millions of years old and 200,000 years just still didn't look like enough. So he thought about what happens when meteors fall in and crash into the earth. They come in at quite high speed and smash into the ground. They're often vaporized in the process because they release all their kinetic energy of movement as heat. So he calculated what if we started off with a lot of individual pieces of the sun all distributed out in the re outer reaches of the solar system and they all collapsed down from there under gravity into the center where the mass of the sun is now. And that amount of infalling led, led Kelvin to an estimate that he could account for the sun having a life of 20 million years, which is much more like it. But by the time he'd done this calculation, sadly it turned out that the geologists had moved the goalposts again. And in fact, they were now talking about the earth being not just millions but perhaps hundreds of millions or billions of years old. But of course back in those days Lord Kelvin didn't know about radioactivity and the energy stored in the atomic nucleus. Radioactivity wasn't discovered for another 30 years after Kelvin was doing those uh, estimates and it was discovered that you got quite a lot of energy out when heavy atoms like radium or uranium would split sponta spontaneously, spitting out other particles and energy. And that the amount of power locked in the nucleus was thousands of times more than that of any chemical bonding caused by the atoms joining together and sharing their electrons. And of course in the uh, 20th century that was followed up by the discovery of nuclear fission where we could deliberately take heavier elements like uranium and smash them apart and release the energy inside them either in the uncontrolled manner of a nuclear explosion or more carefully controlled inside a nuclear reactor and make useful energy out of it. You do get plenty of energy and that would be uh, thousands of times more than you get from any chemical burning process. But the sun is not made of heavy metals like uranium, it's made of hydrogen and helium, the light elements as we've already seen. So it was a slightly different process that was required, and that is the process of nuclear fusion, whereby the light elements are turned into heavier ones. And stars act like pressure cookers, cooking up the hydrogen that's the most common element in the universe and smashing the nuclei of hydrogen together. The nuclei of a simple hydrogen atom is a proton, single positively charged particle shown in red on the diagram there. We start with four of them at the top and we smash them together in pairs to create a two particle nucleus with one neutron and one proton. That's a hydrogen two or deuterium nucleus and in the process we get a burst of energy 
we get a one of these little gray particles that's a positron and that's an antimatter electron and it will go on and find an ordinary electron and annihilate with it and give us a little bit more energy and we get a gamma ray which is just a high energy form of light carrying a lot of the energy away so that's the first step then we add another proton and we get some more energy and a gamma ray and we get a three particle nucleus two protons and a, nu a neutron a two protons and a neutron is a helium three nucleus and you can smash two of those together and turn it into a helium four nucleus shown at the bottom there four particles two neutrons two protons and you get two protons back so if you do the the cosmic accounting here you start with four protons at the top you add two more at the second stage so that's six going in you get two out at the end so it's a net four and you end up with one four particle nucleus of helium helium four there but it releases energy at all those stages along the way and that's more than enough to power a star like the sun for billions of years so that process is going on inside the core inside the pressure cooker of the sun and it's only right in that core because it needs the very high temperatures and very high pressures to cram those positively charged protons together being both positively charged they want to repel each other with the electrostatic force and so you have to smash them together quite hard to overcome that here's a diagram of the insides of the sun and you can see we have the core in the center where that fusion process is carried out the energy streams away from that heating up the outer layers of the sun which then convect around and like boiling treacle bring it to the surface and then once there reaches a sufficiently low pressure at the surface it can uh, escape again as radiation in the form of visible light and infrared heat radiation well let's have a look at what we see on the surface of the sun and i must just say don't try looking at the sun with any optical instrument binoculars or telescope unless you absolutely know what you're doing and how to do it safely because it can be very dangerous there's a lot of heat in the radiation from the sun and you can burn your retina and your eye very very quickly so here's a picture i took of the sun with a very special telescope that allows me to do that safely this was taken in 2004 and it shows the planet venus crossing in front of the disk of the sun there so you can see how much larger the sun appears compared to venus Venus is of course about the same size as the Earth and right in the center of that picture there's a couple of little tiny specks which are sunspots sometimes the Sun has much more activity than others and here's a NASA image of a couple of groups of sunspots much larger and much more complicated and we've zoomed in on one of them on the uh, enlargement on the right there and you can see the dark centers of the sunspots and the material emanating around from them flowing away from them with a very curious pattern and then the surrounding boiling treacle like surface of the of the ordinary parts of the sun now these are not holes these are not really even dark the temperature of the center of those sunspots is around 3000 degrees they just look faint and dark in these photographs by contrast with the much brighter surrounding surface if you looked at them on their own they would be glowing red hot but if you look at that pattern around the outside of the sunspots it's very reminiscent of the pattern you get in a magnetic field around a bar magnet if you drop iron filings on a sheet of paper you get the idea here there's a sunspots at the bottom and iron filings on a sheet of paper with a magnet underneath and uh, you can see the way the, the field lines do the same sort of pattern as you get from the sunspots we can look at that in in three dimensions here's a side-on view of a sunspot grouping and you can see how the material is in fact flowing 
around from one sunspot to the other, making these great loops out from the surface of the sun, the materials following those magnetic field lines. It's as if there's a giant magnet underneath the surface of the sun. And it's true that the sunspots are either a north pole or a south pole, and you do tend to find that if you look at any group of sunspots, they'll always be there in pairs. It can get quite complicated, but nevertheless, there's always a North Pole for every South Pole. Other features that we see on the Sun are some of these eruptions off the surface. This is a photograph that I took with a small amateur telescope showing some fire fountain eruptions on the edge of the Sun there against the blackness of space, throwing material out and falling back under gravity. And then in the middle of the disk of the sun, we've got some little darker lines, and I've marked those as filaments. It turns out filaments and prominences are the same thing. They're just, as the material comes up away from the sun, it cools. And so when you are looking directly down on it, with the brightness of the sun in the background, it looks uh, dark against that much brighter background, much in the same way that the sunspots do. But we can use other instruments to look at the sun. This is the Solar Dynamics Observatory, a space satellite looking at the sun using x-rays. And we can see uh, a very active region of sunspots in the middle there in this rather weirdly colored picture. Lots of loops and eruptions on the surface. Now we can also trace the temperature because the x-rays come from very, very hot gas. And it's a little bit of a mystery as to why some of the outer layers above the normal visible surface of the sun get so hot. It's something to do with all of the twisted magnetic fields interacting with the thin gas that heats it up. When we have a solar eclipse, we can see that outer layer of the sun called the corona. It's a great cosmic coincidence that the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun but it's also 400 times nearer so they appear almost the same size in the sky so it can line up and block out the main disk of the bright part of the sun and let us see the hot outer thin wispy corona the outer atmosphere of the sun and we can even see the sun's magnetic field the overall north and south pole there being slightly angled and creating structure in that very, very hot, thin gas. Now, sometimes the sun is even more active and throws off solar flares. Here's a great image of an enormous eruption from the surface of the sun. And I've actually got that as an animation for you here. So with the background music going, we have an enormous eruption coming off the sun there. And you can see how the surface of the sun is boiling and changing all the time. Here we go again, I'll show it to you another time. Absolutely huge eruption. Now fortunately that one's not pointing our way. It's over towards the edge of the sun and so it's not facing straight towards the earth. You can imagine that the sun is producing these all of the time and only very occasionally does one erupt right in what would be the line of sight from the sun to the earth so that we're staring straight down the gun barrel of this eruption and it sends a huge jet of charged particles and ionizing radiation across space towards the earth. Now very uh, helpfully we have our magnetic shields up. This is uh, always good in Star Trek and it's good for the planet earth to have its shields up as well because it means that most of the harmful effects of all of this uh, material coming from the sun that takes about 36 hours to travel 150 million kilometers from the sun to the earth then gets deflected by those shields around and away. But some of it gets in and it gets in at the weak points which you can see are the north and south poles of the earth's magnetic field and there it can get channeled down in and crash into the Earth's atmosphere. And when it does so, it creates the northern lights. The Earth's atmosphere acts as the last line of defense against this uh, radiation coming from space. And the atoms get lit up as their electrons are knocked into crazy orbits. 
you get that characteristic green color that's from oxygen high up in the earth's atmosphere and you get uh, the, some of the other colors from nitrogen and so on the different molecules and gases within our earth's atmosphere it's an example of a solar flare that was a very very powerful one indeed so powerful that it actually overloaded the spacecraft uh, x-ray detectors this is again filmed in x-rays so this was a huge eruption producing a very powerful uh, beam of uh, matter and energy but it's on the edge of the sun it wasn't coming towards us here on earth so it didn't disrupt anything however here's one that did come our way we've got several satellites looking at the sun from different angles and so we can chart the solar wind in three dimensions on the uh, rotating diagram there you've got the sun in the center and the planets marked as little different colored squares and you can see how an enormous pulse of material erupts away from the sun there it goes and travels out across the solar system sweeping across the uh, planet earth which is the little yellow uh, dot at three o'clock on the diagram there so that one definitely did come our way and on the right there we can see the uh, effect the auroral display of northern lights taken in august of 2011 from minnesota there that resulted from all that material crashing into our atmosphere but the most powerful solar flare on record was this one it was called the carrington event it was in september of 1859 richard carrington a british amateur astronomer was in his garden plotting the sunspots on a piece of card and projecting the image of the sun onto the card for safety and he suddenly saw what he's marked on the diagram here as points a and b two very bright regions that popped up really quite quickly so he popped next door to get his friend bring him around to witness it and within those few minutes the bright eruption had moved and was now at location c and d on the diagram now this eruption was right in the center of the sun's disk and so it came straight towards us and 36 hours later we had the most magnificent auroral displays across the whole planet on the right is frederick church's painting of 1865 and that's painting of the aurora as viewed from the caribbean normally the aurora is a northern or southern polar region event only but when you get a really powerful magnetic storm and a really powerful eruption then it can drive the aurora to much lower latitudes all the way down to the equator almost so let's just wind back we talked a little bit about the sun having formed eight at uh, the beginning of the solar system 4.6 billion years ago out of a cloud of swirling dust and gas uh, and gravity was causing things to fall inwards the sun formed right at the center of all of that and the planets begin to form in the disk now if you have a very very large nebula you can form a much larger star and if you don't then perhaps you'll end up with a smaller star or even more than one star and you can get groups of them but i thought i'd just show you so the relative sizes of different stars show you that star, our sun is a relatively modest star here it is the sun at the left there compared for size with sirius and pollux and the orange giant star arcturus and jupiter's on the diagram there would you believe as a single pixel and the earth well not visible at this scale so the sun is really quite a small star compared to those others but those others are by no means the largest we can step the scale up so that we have the sun as one pixel and Sirius, Pollux and Arcturus now look small compared to Rigel, Aldebaran and then the supergiants Betelgeuse and Antares there. But Antares is not the largest, the largest star we know is YV Canis Majoris which makes even Antares look fairly modest. It has about 200 times the mass of our Sun and if it was where the Sun is the whole solar system would fit easily inside the envelope of uh, yv canis majoris there what about the other end of the size scale 
Well, there's a quadrant of the sun there and a small star next to it for scale, a red dwarf star. Our sun is a yellow dwarf. There are slightly smaller ones, which would be orange dwarfs. And then the smallest stars of all that are proper stars are these red dwarfs. And they can be as small as seven and a half percent of the mass of the sun. That's the smallest mass at which the pressure cooker effect in the center manages to build a temperature of 10 million degrees Kelvin. At 10 million degrees, there is enough energy to smash those protons, those hydrogen nuclei together and form the first step in the food chain, which is deuterium on that diagram that I showed you of the four steps of nuclear fusion. That first step is the most difficult. And it, as I said, needs 10 million degrees. So you need to be at least seven and a half percent of the mass of the sun in order to do that. And then you'll be a small red dwarf star. A planet like Jupiter shown there to the same scale is really a failed star. It's a, we call it a gas giant. It's made of more or less the same mixture of hydrogen and helium, but it's only 0.1% of the mass of our sun. And to have enough mass to generate the temperature for nuclear fusion and be a red dwarf star, it would need to take 75 Jupiters and pack them together. So there was no danger that Jupiter was ever really going to manage that. But in between, we have these weird objects called brown dwarfs. We've got three of them shown on the diagram here. And underneath, you can see their names, Ted A1, Gliese 229b, which is the brown dwarf, which is another type of failed star, larger than Jupiter, but smaller than its host, Gliese 229a, that is the primary star of that system. And uh, we, we've got Weezer 1828. And you can see the temperatures underneath them. These brown dwarfs are like Jupiter, but bigger, but not big enough to hit that 10 million degree temperature to, to turn on nuclear fusion. They probably got a lot of energy out of the Lord Kelvin-like gravitational collapse that formed them to warm them up a bit, but particularly objects like Te Day 1 there, those probably managed to build a temperature of a million degrees in the center, and that's enough to do a little bit of nuclear fusion. Just enough to take any deuterium, that two nucleus uh, form of hydrogen with a neutron and a proton, two particles in the nucleus, you can fuse deuterium at about a million degrees. The thing is, there's only a tiny fraction of deuterium in the hydrogen that you uh, are made of as an ordinary star, so it really doesn't do you very much good, but it's enough to heat TED A1 up a little bit. And you can also use uh, some nuclear tricks with elements like lithium at around a million degrees and get a bit of energy that way. So some of these brown dwarfs get a little bit of an energy boost from that and it warms them up from being warmer than Jupiter, uh, as you can see on the diagram there. But they're really failed stars. So if we ignore the brown dwarfs and the planets and we look at just the ordinary stars, this is the classic Hertzsprung-Russell diagram of stars. We have those red dwarfs down at the bottom right, and you work your way up through the orange stars, the yellow stars like the sun there, and then up to the white stars like Sirius, and on up to the blue ones. This is just increasing temperature, exactly like heating an iron bar. You start with red hot, then orange, then yellow, then white hot, and if you kept on going, your iron bar would melt, but the next step is blue hot for stars. And it's also the mass. The heavier a star is, the more massive it is, the greater the pressure and the temperature in its core. And so the more vigorously it's able to carry out fusion. And so you get a higher temperature for a bigger star. And so the little stars at the bottom there, the red dwarfs are sitting there 
barely able to do fusion at all. And the ones right at the top left, the blue giants, are ripping through their fuel at an enormous rate. You can also see that the line's not quite straight. And that's because of a process that kicks in round about the mass of the sun. Uh, you can get the core temperature up to about 15 million degrees and a second process involving carbon can kick off there, which accelerates the nuclear fusion, which is why that line is not quite straight. But above it, you can see the giants and the super giants and there are different processes going on in those. And then also down at the bottom, the white dwarfs. Now we'll talk all about those in turn as we go on. So in the middle of a sun-like star, you have a balance of the energy released by fusion pushing outwards versus the force of gravity trying to crush the star down. But eventually, once the hydrogen in the core of the star runs out, then that fusion can't continue at the same rate and the gravity will overwhelm the core. And a rather curious process then happens to stars like the Sun. Rather than collapsing, they turn into these red giants. They swell right up and cool on their outer surfaces. And the reason is a little bit complicated. Here's a diagram of what's going on in the middle. What happens is that the helium that's been made in the first stage of an ordinary star falls to the center and is inert. It can't be used as fuel. So you get a ball of this uh, leftover helium gradually growing in the middle. And because it can't be used for nuclear fusion, can't release any energy, it tends to collapse on itself and get in increasingly dense. And as it does so, it releases gravitational energy, which of course turns into heat, and that acts like a spark plug, igniting a shell of hydrogen that uh, undergoes fusion around the outside of it. And then that shell continues to dump more helium into the core, so the helium core grows bigger, and the shell then moves outwards, burning its way out through the star. But as that hydrogen shell advances out through the star, it's putting out more and more overall energy because the surface area of that sphere growing inside the star is getting disproportionately larger and larger as it increases. And that acts to push the outer layers away and creates this swelling up to form a red giant. And indeed, in the end, it drives the outer layers of the star away completely and exposes the dead nuclear core, that helium core in the middle, um, and leaves us with what we call a planetary nebula, which is a silly name. They shouldn't be called planetary anything because they have nothing to do with planets. They're all to do with stars. They're the dead smoke rings of a, a star that's puffed itself apart by this process of shell burning. Right in the center of several of these, you can see there is a hot white dwarf star right in the middle there, surrounded by layers of gas. And you can see how it's puffed off the uh, outer layers, perhaps not all at once, but in several waves. And sometimes it's puffed it off out along the north and south spin axis as the ejected plasmas got caught up in a spinning magnetic field, which creates those butterfly type shapes and the torus type shapes. Right in the centre, the dead nuclear core is one of these white dwarf stars and no nuclear fusion is going on inside these. They've collapsed down under gravity to a density limit and that density limit is held up from further collapse by the electron soup that's flowing around inside the white dwarfs. The electrons are all negatively charged, they don't like each other very much, they don't want to be compressed together. And this electron degenerate matter, through a, a trick of quantum mechanics, is like the fifth state of matter beyond plasma. A sugar cubed size of electron de degenerate matter would weigh around a tonne, it's very very dense indeed, and a white dwarf containing half the mass of the sun will collapse down to be about the size of the earth.
There's a picture there of uh, the nearest, uh, brightest star to us called Sirius that has a white dwarf companion called the Pup marked with the little arrow there orbiting around it. So that used to be a red giant and has now collapsed down just to leave the dead core there. And these white dwarfs, they don't release any more energy from fusion. They're just very hot to begin with. And they do indeed cool down over billions of years and eventually they'll fade out as a black dwarf. But if you have a star much larger than the sun, then it can generate enough pressure and temperature right in the centre, around about 100 million degrees Kelvin, and then helium nuclei formed in the first stage of the nuclear fusion process from hydrogen can get rammed together tightly enough that they themselves combine to make the next elements carbon and oxygen. That suddenly releases a, another burst of activity within the star and you end up with of course the carbon oxygen falling to the center and a helium burning shell around that and a hydrogen burning shell around that in these layers. And if you keep going for larger stars, really very big stars indeed, they can work their way through the elements. The so hydrogen makes helium, helium makes carbon. You can then get neon, oxygen, silicon, and finally the silicon can be fused to make iron, Fe right in the middle there. Now, you can see that actually the efficiency of these processes gets worse and worse as time goes on. For a star like this, the hydrogen fuel perhaps lasts you seven million years. The helium's only gonna last half a million years. Carbon burning will cost, will give you 600 years only. Neon burning, one year. Oxygen being converted to silicon, six months. And silicon to iron, just a single day before you're out of options. You've now made an iron core. It'll be a very hot, high pressure iron core. And if you try to compress the iron and make heavier elements like lead or bismuth or tin, any of those, then actually, instead of it releasing energy, which is the life force of stars, it saps energy, it costs energy to build the heavier ones. The iron nuclei are the most energy efficient nuclei of all. They're the most stable. And so once the star starts trying to do that, instead of the core releasing energy, it's going to start eating up energy, cool down very rapidly, and the whole core is then going to not be able to have the temperature and pressure to resist the pull of gravity. And so the core collapses in on itself. The overlying layers now have nothing supporting them, so they fall inwards as well under gravity until it all crashes together in the center and then rebounds in an enormous supernova explosion that tears the star apart. And this is the Crab Nebula, the result of such a supernova explosion. Got a little animation which illustrates it. We know that it's still expanding outwards out into space and we can work backwards and figure out that it uh, was the result of an explosion in the year 1054 AD. And that ties up perfectly with Chinese astronomers who reported seeing the explosion and seeing a bright new guest star, as they called it, that was as bright as the full moon for three months, can be seen in daylight until it gradually faded away. And of course, a thousand years later, we're still able to see the expanding shock wave. But that's process of the explosion there was so violent that it's thrown all the elements that were made in those outer layers of the star back across the cosmos and enables the formation of second and third generation stars and planetary systems containing all those elements like carbon and silicon and oxygen and so on that are so important. But the shock wave of the explosion itself is where some of the heavier elements like lead and bismuth and tin and uranium all get built in the uh, expanding shockwave of these stars when they explode. 
But right in the center, the core is crushed down, not even the electron uh, degeneracy pressure is able to withstand it for this size of star. And the uh, electrons and protons are rammed together to form neutrons, the negative electrons combine with the positive protons to make neutral neutrons. And you end up with a ball of neutrons about 10 kilometers across that might weigh several times the mass of the sun and has the density of an atomic nucleus. So a teaspoonful weighs five trillion tons. This is an absolutely unimaginable amount of density. And there's an artist's impression of a neutron star and Manhattan Island and the Hudson River there, look. Now these neutron stars pick up a lot of spin as well, rather as a skater pulling their arms in on an ice rink, they, uh, as they condense and contract down, all that angular momentum spins them very fast. And they tend to have very strong magnetic fields. And those magnetic fields interact with the material around them and we get radio waves coming off in pulses as they spin. So here's the Crab Nebula in visible light. We can overlay on top of it an x-ray picture and you can see the pulsar in the center and the whirlpool of material surrounding it where it's spinning at incredible speed and generating uh, a jet of material coming off it. All of that activity adds up to making a terrific uh, amount of radio noise coming away from it. And we hear it here on Earth as pulses. You can hopefully hear the pulses recorded from a radio telescope here of the sound of a spinning pulsar. But neutron stars are not the final end stage. They're made of this neutron degenerate matter and they're only stable up to around three times the mass of our sun. Anything more than that exceeds what's called the tolman oppenheimer volkoff limit after the scientists that uh, calculated it. And what that basically says is that beyond three solar masses, the pressure is so great that the neutron degenerate matter cannot withstand the force of gravity and so the neutron stars get crushed down even further. Now sometimes the neutron stars will get formed in pairs. If you had a binary pair of very large stars formed out of a very dense nebula, you might get two of them and they will, both the stars will eventually form a neutron star and the neutron stars can then orbit around each other emitting gravity waves and spiraling inwards as they do so. We've actually detected this with the LIGO and Virgo gravity wave detectors now and listened to the sound of the wobbling of space caused by the gravity waves from neutron stars that collided. And when they collide, it creates what's called a killer nova. And the killer nova can be another source of building those heavier elements, heavier than iron. It's Ordinary stars make everything up to and including iron while they're still alive. When they explode as a supernova or when two neutron stars blow up like this as a killer nova, that's where you get all the energy to make the heavy elements, the lead and the gold and the uranium and all those others. Uh, they're roughly half of the gold in your wedding ring was built in a collision between two neutron stars in a killer nova explosion, and the rest came from previous generations of supernovae. But of course, the end stage either of uh, putting too much material together by adding a little bit at a time to an existing neutron star, or by smashing two together and exceeding that Tolman Oppenheimer Volkov limit of three solar masses, results in gravity winning and everything collapsing down to form a black hole gravity without limits, a whole new region of space-time cut off from the rest of us is formed inside what's called an event horizon and the story of black holes is a whole other talk and we will uh, get on to that in the next episode of the Introduction to Astronomy.
thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed that and I'll see you next time.